Hello and welcome to today's online lecture on the Scots-Irish in America Origins and Migrations. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is senior genealogist Rhonda McClure. Rhonda is a nationally recognized professional genealogist and lecturer. Before joining American Ancestors in 2006, she ran her own genealogical business for 18 years. In addition to numerous articles, she is the author of 12 books, including the award-winning The Complete Idiot's Guide to Online Genealogy, and is the editor of the most recent edition of the Genealogist Handbook for New England Research. Her areas of expertise include immigration and naturalization, late 19th and early 20th century urban research, New England, Midwest, Southern, German, Italian, Scottish, Irish, French Canadian, and New Brunswick research. Now, the Scots-Irish have been immigrating to America since the early 18th century. Today, there are more than 5.4 million Americans who have Scots-Irish ancestry. But who are the Scots-Irish? Where did they emigrate from? Where did they settle? From their origins in Scotland and Northern Ireland to their migration to the American colonies, uh, senior genealogist Rhonda McClure will discuss the rich history and enduring legacy of the Scots-Irish in America, providing research tips and resources along the way. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore, and you'll find a link to this downloadable PDF in your reminder emails, as well as in uh, your follow-up email after today's broadcast. We are also recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content from this presentation on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. So if you miss something on today's first listen, not to worry, you can always go back and review the presentation later. All right, I know we have a lot to get through, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Rhonda. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, the, you know, the immigration of any group is one of my passions, and so I'm super excited to be talking about the Scots-Irish, when they came over, some of, you know, and everything that kind of affected why they came here. So to start things off, who are the Scots-Irish? Uh, there are a lot of different terms that we often use interchangeably and or that you've seen. Scots-Irish, Scotch-Irish, and Ulster Scots are basically variants on the same group of individuals. These are people who left Scotland and settled in the confines of the province of Ulster within the island of Ireland. And they brought with them their Presbyterian religious beliefs, uh, that being their state or official uh, religion. Some of their descendants, usually within two to three generations after the big move into Ireland, came to North America. And that is how we get the Scots-Irish uh, you know, influx that we will talk about later on today. So as I mentioned, uh, the Scots-Irish ended up in what was the province of Ireland. On the left, you can see the four provinces of the entire island of Ireland. And then we, I have highlighted the counties of Northern Ireland. Those are only uh, part of the Ulster province. A couple of the counties that were in the province of Ulster ended up in, during the division, ended up in the Republic of Ireland. So what you're seeing of the Northern Ireland, those are the counties that today make up Northern Ireland. They are not all the counties though of the Ulster province. We're going to go way back. We're gonna start with the 17th century Ireland. Uh, known for its revolt, confiscation, and ultimately the plantation. 
So to start things off, we are going back actually into the latter part of the 16th century with the Nine Years' War between 1594 and 1603. And this is where things are going to start to heat up between the English, the Irish, uh, Tyrone's Rebellion, and then the Irish Lords versus uh, the English. So up to this point, uh, they've sort of been, Ireland's sort of been, you know, relegating itself and so on. Uh, in 1601, we have the Battle of Kinsale, and then ultimately all of this back and forth results in the flight of the Earls in 1607. Now the flight of the Earls is really that moment where all the Irish Earls up and leave. And you'll see here from the map that they left out of Rathmullen and ultimately end up uh, in a rather circuitous route going all the way down to Rome. By this point of their flight, James I of England, AKA James VI of Scotland, has begun his uh, plantation scheme and his methods of controlling the island of Ireland. Technically, the plantation begins in 1609 uh, by King James I. However, he has been uh, in power and has been manipulating things since uh, before the flight of the earls. Uh, but the Ulster plantation and that scheme was generally, uh, you know, was his idea to bring over English and Scottish settlers to gain control of uh, all of Ireland. He ident you know, he wanted to bring over those who thought like him, uh, who had similar religious beliefs, Anglican for the English, Presbyterian for the Scottish, bring them over and kind of, you know, put into control un over the predominantly Catholic Irish uh, areas. Uh, those who were coming from the Scottish uh, countrysides were coming primarily from the lowlands of Scotland. And you'll see in the little tiny map that there were the six Ulster counties that made up the plantation in the Maroon. And then there are the uh, other three that are going to still get their own plantations. However, they are going to be uh, controlled by other people. As I mentioned, the bulk of the Scottish immigrants to Ulster come from the lowlands uh, and up and just over the English border where you have some mix between the Scots and the English. So who got the land? Well, there are different levels of individuals who got land and the biggest were known as the undertakers and or planters. You see both terms used. These are the individuals who were encouraged to bring over English and Scottish tenants. They acquired roughly 73% of the land in the province of Ulster. They were required to plant 10 families or 24 men per thousand acres that they were given. The other caveat was that they could not rent to Irish tenants. So the idea was to supplant the Irish with English and Scottish tenants. Another group were the soldiers, those who were servitors and adventurers uh, who had served the English crown. And they were allowed to rent to Irish Catholics but they only acquired about 13% of the land in question. There are some areas that were given to the Irish who were local to, who were loyal to the crown. We'll see a map that highlights this in just a second. And then there were a couple of institutions, Trinity College and the Church of Ireland who were also given their shares of land. So here we have the map and it's sort of color coded showing lands assigned by the groups. So the grayish, uh, the, there's the uh, light, light part of Donegal that has the red arrow. That is the part that the servitors and the Irish who were loyal to the crown were given. 
as were parts of Cavan and Amar. Uh, but the biggest area for them was in Donegal. The Antrim and Down areas were not part of the official um, Ulster institution, uh, Ulster plantation. However, those areas are going to fall under a couple of major Scottish lairds. And then the areas that are sort of the light tan are where the Scottish undertakers, so Strabane and the other part of Donegal, parts of Fermanagh. And so this kind of tells you how it was all carved up. As I mentioned, Antrim and Down, they have their own uh, individuals who are going to take over those areas. Most notably is Randall MacDonald, who will become the first Earl of Antrim. He is granted 300,000 acres. He is, brings over Lowland Scots, and he settles in the North Antrim area. James Hamilton and Hugh Montgomery, along with some other uh, investors, for lack of a better term, they are going to get the northeast of County Down. Also, they are bringing over their own group of Scottish settlers. Theirs are coming from southwestern counties of Scotland. And then the southern part of Antrim is uh, falls under English landowners, most notably Sir Arthur Chichester, and his, he brings his settlers from England. As far as the uh, Scottish uh, sections of Antrim and Down, there are some very valuable collections of papers and manuscripts that can help you in tracing ancestors who were coming from these areas. Uh, there is the Earl of Antrim's estate papers, and that uh, collection is available at the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland in Belfast. Uh, that is probably the largest collection and the starting point you want for anybody who ended up under the Earl of Antrim. Meanwhile, we have the two published manuscripts for James Hamilton and for the Montgomerys. Those have been made available through the National Library of Scotland. And what's really nice is that the, the you know, you can view the pages, you can search within the manuscript. Be judicious if you're searching for ancestral names. These are more the history and what's going on. So your individual tenant may not be mentioned. What may be mentioned is the areas from Scotland where some of the people were coming from and how things were getting divvied up and handled. So it may be better to kind of go through the volume rather than trying to do a quick search for, a, for an ancestor's name. Similarly, we have the Montgomery manuscripts. And again, this is his colonization of the Ards in County of Down. Again, available through the National Library of Scotland. They've digitized this collection. These two men are you know, synonymous with a, a large section of Scots-Irish that had nothing to do with that Ulster plantation that James was creating in the other areas. And yet a lot of our people are going to come out of this area. Okay, so here we are seeing a map that is created by the Ulster Historical Foundation, and it is showing the Scots of, uh, of Ulster. It is kind of showing you where some of these people are coming from so that you can see the, the areas, uh, the little um, kind of maroon squares in, the Sc in Scotland are identifying the landlords, the principal Scottish landlords. And then what you're seeing is where these people were coming from. So remember when I was talking about Hamilton and Montgomery and theirs were coming from you know, the westerly, southern, southwesterly areas of Scotland, that's that dark gray where I have two of the arrows pointing and you can literally see uh, Hamilton, AKA Abercorn as one of the, uh, Scottish landlords, 
and their people are going to come across the North Channel and settle into Antrim down area. Similarly, we have the lowlands, uh, which is a slightly lighter tan uh, with the two arrows in Scotland. That is predominantly where uh, the Earl of Antrim was getting his people and bringing them over. So let's talk about the land distribution. So of the area, there were nine precincts that were created throughout some of the counties that would ultimately become Scottish precincts. In other words, the Scots were sort of over them. <clears throat> County Armagh had the Fuse area. <clears throat> County Cavan has Clanky and Telehunko. County Donegal uh, has Boila and Bana, it's, which is a combined area. And then they have Portlow as well. So you can see that a lot of these are sort of spread out a little bit. Uh, County Fermanagh has Nocnini and Maheraboy. Again, not side by side. The biggest ones that are side by side would be in County Tyrone. That would be uh, the precincts of Strabane and Mount Joy that are literally side by side. Strabane is one of the areas in which you will find that uh, the Hamiltons in uh, have some of their land, uh, most notably the uh, Abercorn uh, estates are going to be found in the Strabane area. And then we've got other air land distributions uh, that were allocated to the English in a slight, you know, a slightly different color, but that doesn't escape the fact that we still have like, you know, the areas of specifically Antrim and County uh, Down, which were technically not part of that Ulster plantation. So these precincts are just the Ulster plantation that James was like designing himself. And then we have to remember Antrim and Down where the other Scots uh, settlements were. There is the one forgotten county uh, of County Monaghan. Technically, it was part of the plantation, but not. The settlements began in 1591. What's unique about this is that most of the lands were in native Irish hands, uh, predominantly under the McMahons uh, until the mid 17th century. They also had large influxes of English, Scots, and Welsh settlers that settled there between 1660 and 1730. The 1659 census uh, only showed 434 households of English and Scottish origins. By 1730, nearly every parish had British householders. So this county technically had a settlement and was part of the plantation, but from the Scots-Irish formation, it is not as critical and less people were coming from here that had that Scots-Irish connotation. Out of the plantations, what we see though is that all of these owners of these larger estates, uh, especially the ones that were getting upwards of 100,000 acres, uh, these are individuals who from this for, you know, well into the 1800s, our people are going to be residing on these estates. So the owners of the larger estates, you know, were going to be the aristocracy. Um, they could have had several estates in different sections of Ireland, both in the north and in what ultimately becomes the Republic, uh, as well as estates in Britain. Smaller estates between 1,000 and 3,000 acres were often owned by more modest farmers, uh, and records for these smaller estates are less likely to be available to us. One of the reasons that I'm bringing up the landed estates is because of the uh, that they may be the only surviving records that we have to identify those of our ancestors who were coming later on. Uh, and they exist because of this entire kind of plantation uh, thinking. All of the landowners though, for these quote landed estates were members of the Church of Ireland. 
One of the benefits or the strengths of the estate records is that they are an excellent resource for 18th and early 19th century ancestors. So as the Scots-Irish are, you know, some of them are coming over to North America, you've still got those who are still residing back where they have been. The, uh, you know, the estate records may be the only source for searching your poor ancestors because we don't have things like census and other valuable records like civil uh, registration and things that we're used to using. They are one of the few record sets that may have survived in areas where either church records started late or uh, were destroyed uh, prior to, you know, or after your ancestors lived and moved on. The weaknesses, of course, is that the rentals uh, and tenant lists are often only to the larger tenants. However, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be checked because very often in the rental books, there may be smaller uh, tenants listed as sub tenants or cottiers. Uh, they are covering limited periods of time in these rental lists, and not all areas of Ireland had the large landed estates. Some of, especially the smaller ones, uh, the records have either been destroyed or they are still in pro, uh, private hands. Returning to our history of what is going on in Ireland, uh, they are just constantly, you know, and it's understandable, they, they resent what's going on, the taking over of their, of their lands by, you know, the British and the Scottish under the auspices of the monarch. So there are resentments uh, by these Irish over the loss of lands, uh, especially the Catholic gentry who uh, up to this point had lands and were living fine. So there is the 1641 rebellion and this was led by the Catholic gentry who you know, stirred up the Irish military and many towns in Ulster uh, were captured by, uh, captured by the rebels. All, and it ultimately leads to what is known as the Porta Down Massacre in 1641. For those of you who may be interested in, you know, did my people participate, et cetera, in this particular uh, upheaval. There is a great uh, online website that is the, has digitized the depositions that were taken after this um, uh, the the situation, and so you can search by name, you can search by county uh, or free text. They have both the transcriptions, but also they have digitized images of the originals as well. Here we have an example of a deposition of Philip Taylor. He is one of the survivors of the Porta Down Massacre. And so you can see that you could view an original. And then also we see, you know, the date that he is, uh, he's giving his deposition. It was in the County of Armagh. And then the nature of his deposition, which has all sorts of great things, arson, assault, and so on. And, so the, like I said, the good news is that you can actually read a transcript rather than trying to read the old English handwriting. Uh, but it gives you a lot of great useful information if you had ancestors in that area in that time. Moving on, we are still trying uh, hard to, you know, reclaim Ireland. And we will see what it be, erupts into the Willamite War of 1690. So there is first the siege of Londonderry in 1689. There's a lot of Protestant resistance. It's a 105 day siege in which over 15,000 will die. The Willamite War is uh, officially takes place in 1690 with the Battle of the Boyne being the big uh, item in 1690, thousands of the settlers from Scotland are going to arrive. And out of this, they are going to be granted what are known as 31 year leases. So these individuals are going to be able to own their lands for 31 years. Uh, the accession of James II, 
who at this point was a Catholic to the throne, is sort of what is going to prompt all of this. Uh, you know, this is why the Protestants are now fighting instead of the Catholics. And in 1688, William of Orange is going to arrive in England. He's been over uh, in the Danish areas. He arrives in England and he is declared king in what was known as the Glorious Revolution. James II fled to France and the following year he landed in Ireland with a large French army. This is where we're going to get that Protestant resistance in Ulster uh, that has already started to mobilize in uh, and erupts in 1689 to become that 105 day siege uh, in Derry. As many as 30,000 settlers, as well as a garrison of 7,000 men, were packed into the city of Londonderry. It's a lot of people. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's reckoned that 15,000 of them died uh, of fever or starvation or were killed in the battle. The siege was lifted in late July, and soon afterwards, a large Willemite force under the command of the Duke of Schomburg landed near Bangor County Down, and by the autumn of 1689, James, James's forces had been all but removed from Ulster. As the war moved south with decisive battle fought at the Boyne on the 1st of July in 1690 and Ogren in 12 July 1691, the province began to recover from the consequences of the conflict. However, the Battle of the Boyne and William of Orange is going to leave a mark that is still seen to this day in Northern Ireland, especially. Moving on to our 18th and 19th centuries, now we're going to see penal laws, the Test Act, and surprise, surprise, some more rebellion. So because the Church of Ireland was the established and supported state church, they start to issue penal laws that are going to make those nonconformists. So not only your Catholics, but your Presbyterians, your Quakers, everybody else uh, suffer. And so the penal laws and, the, and especially the Test Act of 1704 are really going to cause some issues with the, you know, between the Protestants, specifically your Church of Ireland, and all of your other uh, religions. Ultimately, we're going to have the 1798 rebellion this is hoping you know, for political reform, but what we see is a group known as the United Irishmen. And it is originally, you know, yes, there were a lot of Catholics, but there are also the nonconformist uh, Protestants who come together in search of a way to kind of, you know, fight these penal laws and get the rights that they felt they deserved. They were not getting the same rights as Church of Ireland members. And then that ultimately leads to the Act of Union in 1800. And we're going to see a large waves of emigration beginning, especially in this time. The impact of the plantation and all of these things that I've just talked about, especially the penal laws and the nonconformity of religion, et cetera, what we see are that the planters become loyalists. In other words, they are loyal to England. They, are, they want to be part of England. The Irish become agitators and Republicans. They want Ireland to be its own entity. And this is gonna lead to sectarian violence English law, language, and culture is introduced, and it is done in a way that is replacing not only the Irish language and law, but in some aspects trying to completely and utterly eliminate the Irish language, which again forces large waves of immigration. As we move on to the 20th century, home rule, civil war, and partition, Yes, we are continuing on. <clears throat> there was the home rule movement that was supposed to offer the Irish their own chance to rule their Ireland, to rule Ireland. Once again, we have issues with the, uh, the, those who ultimately are in charge, their misunderstanding of what's going on, the, the differences that are happening. Uh, the movement was the, a campaign, obviously, for that self-government. 
Uh, but it was basically sort of uh, that Ireland would still be part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and it would, <clears throat> but it would rule as Ireland, but under the auspices of the UK. Uh, it was a, the uh, dominant political movement of Irish nationalism from 1870 to the end of World War I that comes out of this whole home rule. And what we see is what erupts into the uh, Easter Rising of 1916, which is the first big eruption that is going to ultimately uh, lead into our separation. Uh, there were a lot of arrests and executions that followed that, uh, but the public support shifted from the Home Rule movement to the more radical Sinn Féin party. And in the 1918 general election, the Irish Parliament Party suffered like major, major defeats uh, as far as the individuals that they had had previously elected as uh, MPs and effectively dealt a death blow to that home rule movement. The elected Sinn Féin MPs were not content merely with home rule though, within the framework of the United Kingdom, they instead set up a revolutionary legislature, the Dalaran, and declared Ireland an independent republic. Of course, Britain takes a dim view on this, passed the fourth Home Rule Bill, uh, the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, which was aimed at creating separate parliaments for Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, the former being established in 1921, and the territory can, continues to this day as part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland. But the latter never functioned under this, uh, you know, the auspices of being part of England. And following the Anglo-Irish Treaty that ended the Anglo-Irish War, the 26 of the Ire of Ireland's 32 counties became in December of 1922, the Irish Free State, uh, a dominion within the British Empire. However, it was like its own entity, the Republic of Ireland. We're going to stop for a second. We're gonna talk about church records here in large part because of the fact that we don't have uh, you know, vital records, civil registration in the time period when all of this is going on. So church records become our go-to when we are researching in Ireland, regardless of denomination. The Public Record Office of Northern Ireland has compiled a guide to church records that is a 374 page PDF file describing the various denominations and records that they predominantly have. Uh, they are listed alphabetically by civil parish. They describe the record availability by denomination and where those records are located. One thing to keep in mind uh, with Church of Ireland, even if your people were not Church of Ireland, is keeping in mind some of those, those penal laws. So it wasn't until 1782 that marriages by Presbyterian ministers were given the same legal standing as those of Church of Ireland. And it wasn't until 1844 that a Presbyterian minister could perform what was known as a mixed marriage, where one of the couple was Presbyterian and the other was Church of Ireland. Dissenters of many faiths, as a result, may have married in Church of Ireland institutions to make their marriage legal. The Church of Ireland has one big thing going against it, and that is the fact that there, a large number of their records were deposited within the public record office of the Four Courts compound in Dublin to protect them. However, in 1922, as things are kicking off, there is going to be a skirmish that results in uh, an overtaking of the Four Courts compound by those Irish who were fighting for separation and for you know their own republic. And they're building bombs in there and doing all sorts of fun things. And unfortunately, there's going to be a huge explosion in the Four Courts uh, compound that pretty much destroys the public record office of Ireland 
and most of those uh, Church of Ireland records. So the uh, overseeing body of Church of, for the Church of Ireland has compiled this list that gives us an idea of what survives and where to find it. And so they've got these different colors here. Uh, RCB is the, uh, is the name of the body, like the, the, the uh, acronym for the body that oversees the uh, records of the Church of Ireland. And so all of these colors indicate where records may be found, if they survive, uh, if there are uh, were lost during you know, the explosion of 1922? Are there other materials such as the green? So different colors mean different things and uh, no color, good news. You may actually luck out because those records remained in local custody. In other words, the church didn't turn them over. And so hopefully you can still get access to them. And here's a page from the uh, Church of Ireland Register's Guide showing the uh, dates of the records as was known that were either that were deposited, uh, as you see with the yellow and the gray and the green. And then there are keys to where you may find some of these records today if some alternative exists, as well as comments, a lot of them referring you to rootsireland.ie. So now we're going to touch on or talk about emigration to North America because let's face it, things are always kicking off and people want to get out of Dodge. So one of the earliest large scale migrations out of Ireland will be the Scots Irish themselves who have been you know, here making, you know, making parts of the province of Ulster their own. Uh, it's estimated that between 1717 and 1775, over 200,000 Scots-Irish came to the United States before, you know, it was the United States, primarily from the counties that were in the Ulster province. They often came in groups of families, and some came in large groups led by, not surprisingly, their Presbyterian ministers. Many left due to religious intolerance in Ireland, also what was known as rack renting. Uh, this is like, you know, extortionately high rents uh, for those who were renting, you know, who were tenants. And so these individuals are up and leaving ostensibly because they're hoping for simply, you know, a better life. Uh, also, you find a lot of indentured servants among this group as well. So why did my ancestors leave? Uh, well, there's a lot of different reasons. Paul Milner's uh, talk on Irish emigration gives these factors. Push factors were, as I mentioned, the economic, the rack renting, and uh, also the ongoing drought and famine that just seems to affect a lot of Ireland. There was the religious persecution. And then we have our political refugees, especially the seven, after the 1798 rebellion. And then again, after the 1922 Irish Civil War. Meanwhile, over in the American colonies, you have the pull factors, most notably land. Remember, land is wealth in this time frame. And so if they can get their own little slice of land, they're doing better than if they're renting back in Ireland. Also business, different businesses might have been doing better in the various uh, colonies. Religious tolerance in general in the colonies was definitely a pull factor. And then if somebody from your family or friends from your area had already gone over, they're writing back and saying, come on over, the water's fine. And so you have what's known as the chain migration where somebody has bravely gone and now others are following. So we know that people are going to North America. Let's talk about how they are leaving the Ulster province. One of the first uh, things that I want to mention is that, yes, there is from 1718 to 1775 is talked about a lot for the Scots-Irish who are moving to the colonies. However, there are always 
it's always good to keep up on different uh, publications, uh, especially the Ulster Historical Foundation's uh, annual publication, Familia, which has in uh, has I found this particular article by William Ralston, who is an authority on Northern Ireland and the Ulsters, talks about early connections between Northwest Ireland and America, well predating the time that we're going to see the bulk of the Scots-Irish come over. So if you have somebody who was coming over prior to 1718, you may want to look at uh, articles like this one by William Ralston. Even if your person is not mentioned in this, the sources that he is referencing may help you to further look for information on your ancestor. The biggest group, uh, especially in this time frame, that uh, the earliest group would be those that were coming from the Bon Valley in uh, area which is north of Garve, Garva and Kilray. And it included the parishes of Ahadui, Makasquin, uh, Dunbo, and Ballywillan. And they arrived in 1718. They came to New England. The big reason for it of, was uh, largely bad harvest, drought, and of course the rack renting. Uh, a second group is going to follow. They're going to come from the Foyle Valley area, including the Lagan area of County Donegal. Uh, and of course, migration was not restricted to these areas as migrants left from other parishes in Londonderry, as well in, as in the area north of Strabane in County Tyrone. Uh, these are individuals who, if you've got really, really early people here in the colonies, look to these areas to see what you can find. Uh, some are going to also leave from Coleraine and Londonderry as well. And you see here that we have uh, an image from the Ahadui session book that covers 1702 to 1745 uh, that is available on our, uh, on AmericanAncestors.org, largely because these are some of the people who are coming over and the session books are kind of the business aspects of the Presbyterian Church in this case, uh, and they are going to, you know, if somebody did wrong or they're collecting money, somebody was poor, et cetera, those are the types of things you're going to find in there. There's also a wonderful uh, page devoted to the 1718 migration from Ulster to New England that is available on discoverulster.com, uh, ulsterscots.com. Uh, and is, you know, a great way to familiarize yourself with some of these areas, uh, including Ulster Covenanters, another subset of Presbyterians who are doing things their own way. But this is a great way to have access to some items online. So as mentioned, some of the individuals were from the Ban Valley in Ireland and others, mainly the ones who went to Worcester, came from Foyle Valley. Uh, some of those went north to Casco Bay area and settled in what is now Portland, Maine. Others stayed for a while in Haverhill, Mass, and then kind of ventured out to its surroundings. These initial Ulster Irish ventured to Northern Central and Western New England. And you can actually see this in the names of the places such as Bangor, Belfast, Belfast and Limerick in Maine, Dublin and Londonderry in New Hampshire, and Hillsborough and Orange counties in Vermont, showing them bringing their town names and you know, memories with them. For those who went to Maine, there is an excellent website, the MaineUlsterScots.com. And on their website, it says that the Ulster Scots story in Maine and their influence on New England has been greatly overlooked and oversimplified by traditional historical narratives. U.S. Census data as of 2000 confirms that Maine has per capita the highest percentage of self-identified Scots descendants in the entire USA and ranks third in the country for Scots Irish descendants. Uh, and so they have you know, created this website and this project to put the stories of you know, this group into the history books and to understand uh, 
why they have been forgotten to look at that. Another resource for those coming in in this time frame is the Worcester Mass Scots Irish Settlers database that we have on uh, American ancestors. And you can either view by going volume or you can search for a specific person's name in the traditional search database. Basically, they look like this. They are sketches that have been compiled and they are documented. So they are again going to give you information about where the information is coming from. Keep in mind prior to 1820, if you are trying to find like, like passenger manifests as we know them, they are few and far between. So as the migrations continue and start to reach out beyond New England, you'll see between 1725 and 1775 that they're starting to go into the mid-Atlantic and on down into the southern colonies. The port, primary ports of entry during this time frame were Philadelphia and Newcastle. Once again, the causes were the drought and rack rents, but also a famine that hit in 1740 to 41. And the Marquess of Donegal literally evicted a bunch of his people within the county of Antrim and sent them on their way. Initially, you find these individuals settling in the southern, southeastern areas of Pennsylvania, uh, but by the 1740s, they are moving into the Shenandoah Valley and uh, down in Virginia and on into the Carolinas along the Great Wagon Road, which was being constructed. And so if you are finding your people near these areas of you know, that Great Wagon Road, look to some of the, you know, the Scots-Irish immigration of this time frame. Uh, there are some Scots-Irish pretty much in every one of the 13 original American colonies. However, the main stream that flowed through Pennsylvania, the Valley of, uh, of Virginia, and the Carolina Piedmont are the uh, largest. They are, you know, everything outside of that and what we saw in the New England area, everything else is kind of insignificant in numbers. Uh, there are, a, there is a strength of Presbyterianism that we see in the colonies, uh, in the colonies for like, especially New Jersey. Uh, however, do not automatically equate Presbyterianism with the evidence of Scots Irish settlement. Uh, many of these individuals who were settling in these areas are actually coming from Presbyterian churches that were founded uh, by English and Welsh Presbyterians, as well as those who were coming directly from Scotland, not those who had first stopped off for a couple of generations in Ireland. For those looking to understand what Presbyterian church records over here may help you in identifying where your people were or understanding what Presbyterian churches existed where you have settlements, you want to go to the Presbyterian Historical Society that is in uh, Philadelphia. Within their collections, they have a very important uh, index for searching for places. And that's Hall's Index of American Presbyterian Congregations. First, we gotta know if we've got a congregation before we can set about looking for potential records. So searching Hall's Index is your first step. So here, just to show an example, we have, uh, I literally just put in Pennsylvania. Not surprisingly, there are a lot. However, I just grabbed one of the first ones, they're kind of arranged numerically and then alphabetically. So the 13th Street Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, I clicked on the name of the church and that opened the subsequent window you see here that shows uh, the church's name, the country it was established in, where, uh, when it was organized, uh, if it has changed any kind of names or uh, associations. So we've got people coming in predominantly into Philadelphia and uh, ports, et cetera, but they are also leaving from specific ports. And as far as the Ulster ports, yes, there are ports in the, the Southern area, 
counties of Ireland, but the ones that we are most interested in are going to be the ports uh, within the Ulster province, and those are going to be Londonderry, Portrush, Larne, Belfast, and Newry. And here you can see a map, uh, it's dated 1719, showing the main routes of the, those leaving the Ulster area of Ireland and where they would be settling or where they would be coming into, I should say, the colonies. When it comes to the settlement of the Appalachia, especially uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, you will want to check out David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed. 90% of the back settlers of the Appalachian area were either English, Irish, or Scottish, uh, and an actual majority came from Ulster, the Scottish Lowlands, and the Scots English north of England, so that border area that I showed you earlier. They established in the Southern Highlands of the US and they brought with them a cultural hegemony that was even greater than their proportion in the population. The largest settlement was in North Carolina. Then we see settlements in South Carolina and Tennessee and with them, they bring all of their cultural influences, music, language and storytelling and their agriculture. A couple of additional published resources that you will want for those of you in general who are interested in looking into more about just colonial America, it's Ulster emigration, uh, RJ Dixon's book is probably a great start. And then Billy Kennedy has looked at the Scots Irish in the Carolinas, uh, another good book as well. So migration into the 19th century by 1820, we've already established roughly, you know, a little over 200,000 have come to North America. Between 1820 and 1890, we're going to see over 1.3 million who leave Ireland and come. This is going to include both Irish Catholics and Protestants. Again, we're seeing trickles uh, into the 1800s from the 1798 rebellion and the United Irishmen, then agrarian violence and reform. And of course the great famine uh, is going to really push people uh, to leave Ireland. So far we've touched and focused on those coming into the United States. There was migration to Canada. Uh, the Scots-Irish, who, some who had come to the US, even though they had left, they were still loyalists. And as a result, you are going to see many of them go north to Canada as a result of the American Revolution. Nova Scotia has a very unique settlement in Colchester County in the 1760s that is Scots-Irish as well. And then the Eastern townships of Quebec, the predominantly English speaking area uh, of Quebec that borders with Vermont uh, has some, uh, especially those in Inverness Township uh, that came between 1827 and 1830. And they trace back to the counties of Tyrone and Armagh. And then we also have those who were migrating into Upper Canada, AKA uh, Ontario. Now, Tom, uh, Alexander McNutt uh, is responsible for the group that was coming in the 16, 1760s uh, into Nova Scotia. The uh, group settled in Colchester County, predominantly in the towns of Truro, Onslow, and Londonderry. Nearly 500 families, uh, the four of the bigger family names that you'll find there are McCurdy, Morrison, Blair, and not surprisingly, McNutt. And it was through McNutt's efforts uh, that he brought a group of 50 families from New Hampshire to the, this area of Nova Scotia in the spring of 1761. Keep in mind that Nova Scotia had been Acadian. Uh, they are being uh, evicted, you know, kicked out by the English. And now England is wanting individuals to come and settle this area. Many of our New Englanders, especially Massachusetts and Connecticut, went up for land and were known as planters. However, McNutt's group were coming out of New Hampshire and they were of Scots-Irish origins. And he had, you know, had several proposals for the settlement. He was hoping for seven 
to 8,000 Protestant Irish in Nova Scotia. This is actually accepted by the Board of Trade in London. Uh, he wasn't accept, uh, successful in getting support of the Privy Council, who really feared that such an outmigration from Ireland would harm the British interest in Ireland. Remember, they're still trying to tamp down on the Catholic Irish. Uh, he nevertheless went to Ulster with uh, the Board of Trade's approval to seek out immigrants. And he, in the spring of 1761, he advertised throughout Ulster in the newspapers and whatnot with an offer to industrious farmers and useful mechanics that he they would earn 200 acres of land uh, to the head of the family and 50 to each member of the family. As a result, his effort resulted in 300 colonists coming out of Ireland and arriving in Halifax in October on the ships Hopewell and Nancy. Again, we also see in that Upper Canada, uh, Ontario area, the, some of the settlements are the result of the 1798 rebellion. There's also those who are going to come uh, after the War of 1812. Uh, biggest areas were Toronto, Prescott, Coburg, and Kingston. In 1820, families from the Ards Peninsula uh, in County Down came and settled in uh, Amherst Island. These were all individuals very, very loyal to Great Britain. These are not going to be your Irish Catholics. And one of the ways that we know that is because they were forming Orange Lodges. However, Olive Tree has given us a great uh, kind of page that you can view. And it's talking about, it references the Upper Canada Sundries. They give you the record group that this is coming from that can be found on canadiana.org, the, the images. However, they've extracted the names and basic information. Uh, I've highlighted just three individuals who are identified as coming from Northern Ireland. You know, there's a lot more that are there. So this is a great way to find the information. And then you could go to the original microfilmed records uh, to view what is there. Here we have an 1861 uh, census for uh, St. John, New Brunswick, in which we have what was known as the Irish Ward. What's great about this section is that the individuals, the names of the inhabitants are listed and Unlike, you know, race and where born being just Irish in Ireland, they have identified their, uh, in some places, their county, and in other cases, their, you know, like their townland or their, their civil parish. Once again, another great uh, article out of the publication by the Ulster Historical Foundation. This publication will come if you become a member of the of the organization. This one deals with four 19th century county down pioneers who ended up in British Columbia, not a place we would expect to necessarily think about our Scots-Irish heading over. However, once again, even though it may not talk about your specific people, pay close attention to the sources that he's using because those may be sources that could give you clues as well to your ancestors. As far as records of immigration go, there are a few. Uh, a lot of pu uh, published items uh, that exist, but you wanna look for other records first. You need to have a really solid idea of the timeline uh, for when they arrived and where did they settle. So time, uh, time period and locality. And as a result, there are maybe some of these secondary sources that I've been showing you that could assist you with that. Here we have a passenger list for, from Londonderry, Ireland to Wilmington, Delaware that arrived in 1833. So this is a relatively, you know, just after we start keeping passenger lists. And some of these passengers are saying, we're coming from Letterkenny in County Donegal. So now you've got an exact place besides just a county. A great resource for the early arrivals would be US and Canada uh, Passenger and Immigrations List Index, uh, 1500s to 1900s on Ancestry.com. It's been compiled by William Philby over many, many years. It began in 1985. And 
what he has done is to mine a lot of published uh, resources that have immigrant information and lead you to that so that you can step by step maybe get to the originals. For those arriving in Atlanta, Canada, uh, Terence Punch's Aaron Sons in three volumes is probably your go-to. Uh, he has mined, again, a lot of different resources. Some are census, some are other things, and is supplying you with what he knows about where people were uh, coming from and what their connections were to Ireland. And then we have the passenger list of the Snow Betty Gregg, uh, in 1768, South Carolina offered land both in 1730 and in 1760 to uh, Protestant um, Scots-Irish. So we see a lot of them coming and availing themselves of those land petitions. And what we get very often is the names of the people and their ages in uh, the family at that time. Another great resource uh, that is actually over in the UK is known as DIPM. It stands for Documenting Ireland, Parliament, People, and Migration, most especially the purple section of this, which is the Emig Irish Immigration Database. Uh, 1700 to 1959, the bulk of the records cover the period of mass migration uh, from Ireland of 1820 to 1920. Uh, there are currently uh, over uh, in excess of 33,000 documents here on the IED. Uh, one of the great things is that they are uh, broken down into three types of material. So there are documents that were created by private individuals that would include letters, diaries, journals written by migrants, uh, as well as letters throwing light on emigration. Then you have newspaper material, including advertisements for shipping, uh, emigrant shipping, reports concerning the progress of emigrant shipping, and extracted reports relating to emigration in general. And then finally, you have uh, also included in here would be any births, deaths, and marriages of those overseas that may have been found in newspapers. And then finally, we have the official government papers that include material extracted from reports and inquiries, the record of parliamentary debates, uh, and so on. This should be a bookmark on everybody's uh, browser when they are examining, uh, when they're looking for their Scots-Irish. And they are transcripts. But here we see a transcript of a letter from Ulster, Robert Taylor, who is the emigrant who settled in Pennsylvania in 1799. And it gives information about him and uh, who he married and so on. Uh, so in order to effectively research your Scots-Irish, you need to understand the history and social context, uh, study migration routes and settlement patterns, understand who is going where in general, so that you have a better idea of where to focus your efforts and identify the sources uh, that they've used to uh, go for future research. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Um, I know we're over time, but we will have, uh, we'll stay a little bit longer and answer some questions. Before we do, I do want to let you know about a few upcoming educational opportunities. And if you want to explore your Scots-Irish ancestry even further, consider joining us this June for our one-week research tour to Belfast, Northern Ireland. Delve into the millions of records at premier research centers and archives. Most of these records have not been digitized and are only available when you visit in person. You'll receive one-on-one -on -one assistance from our experts, including uh, senior genealogist Rhonda McClure, whom you just heard from. You'll attend lectures and orientations from local genealogists and really just explore your family history like never before. If you'd like to learn more, visit AmericanAncestors.org slash events. We'll also include a link to this tour in our follow-up email. Um, you may also consider joining some of our upcoming online uh, events, including um, next week, we will have a uh, an online uh, lecture on using GEDmatch um, the week following that, the truth of tracing Scottish clans, and then later next month, a full seminar on researching Catholic ancestors. For these and more, visit AmericanAncestors.org slash events. 
All right, so let's get to some of your questions. Um, there are lots in the uh, in the Q and A, and we'll try to get to as many uh, general questions as we can. Um, Judy asks, generally speaking, you know, there are so many names that are the same, similar surnames, same first names. Any kind of strategies that you could offer when you're trying to tell your family apart from others with the same with the same name. Uh, so basically what you need to do is you're going to have to do kind of a cluster uh, research approach where you have these people, what's the same, what's different? Uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, your Johns are like not always going to marry a Mary. Uh, and so if you can separate them out by who they married, um, where their lands are located, et cetera, that may help uh, with kind of isolating different pockets of people. That's usually my go-to strategy to start with. And in the Ulster plantation, how did planters go about bringing over Scott tenants? You know, what inducements or controls did they use? Um, so, you know, in some instances, it could have just been just that they were going to get a larger piece of land. You know, they were going to be able to do whatever they wanted uh, on their land. It could have been just that the land was better. Uh, depending on where they were bringing them from. Let's, you know, most of Ireland is pretty green. And uh, so that could have been an impetus. There could have been, you know, uh, because of how lands were dispensed in England and, and its, its areas, there's that whole like law of primogeniture where like, you know, first son gets everything. So if you happen to be a second or a third son or a fourth son, maybe the idea of going to Ireland is intriguing because now you've got that opportunity to possibly get your own land. And then of course, there's always those who just simply have wanderlust and can't sit still. Uh, so there were a number of different ways in which they could have, uh, you know, pushed them over or pulled them over. Uh, and in large part, I do believe that it had to do with some of the lands that were being uh, cultivated and offered. Um, a few questions about suggested reading. You know, if so if you want to learn more about uh, the plantation and the history of Northern Ireland more generally, what guides or books would you suggest? Uh, so I will pull up my Kindle and everything, because I've got a boatload of them, to be perfectly honest. Um, there are a number, a lot of them are, are being published through the Ulster Historical Foundation, uh, because they, they, are, they are an authority on this. They literally do have a publication on the Ulster Plantation. Uh, they've also uh, got quite a few ebooks that you can purchase for relatively inexpensive that look at specific things like the 1798 um, rebellion and some of those other items that we were talking about. Uh, one of the things that you may want to also investigate is the the Orange Order, uh, because that is coming out of William of Orange, the Battle of the Boyne. Those are Protestants, and anybody who was involved in an Orange Order, there is that sectarian, you know, divide there. Uh, so there is Jonathan Barden's uh, The Plant Plantation of Ulster that was published by um, the Ulster Historical Foundation, and then there's also the Ulster Plantation in the counties of Armagh and Cavan, 1608 to 1641 by R.J. Hunter is another good one. Uh, I have listed a few volumes in the handouts bibliography that uh, are my go-tos. And uh, then I did show some of the ones, especially for the early Ulster immigration to the colonies. Uh, that is, you know, like one that I have handy all the time. Great. Um, you mentioned kind of passenger lists or the lack thereof um, in some cases, um, but a, a few people have also asked, are there records in Northern Ireland that, you know, kind of show um, people leaving? Uh, so this is one of the reasons that I did touch very, very briefly on the um, uh, the landed estates, sometimes within the rental uh 
either the rental books where they're collecting the rents, then you may see notations of people leaving for America. There's also the Irish newspaper archive. They have, uh, the Belfast newsletter has been published in 1738. And very often you will find announcements of people leaving Ireland there as well. And then the DIPM IED database is another good resource. A few people have asked about Quakers and Quaker Scots Irish. Um, any information, any resources, or any comment on Quakers during this period and from this uh, area? So the Quakers were obviously influenced in when uh, uh, Fox himself goes up and starts to, to you know, proselytize. Uh, and they're, they're a strong religious entity. Uh, they are also going to have a lot of additional, like you, we talked about the penal laws for some of the more established churches. They are going to literally be imprisoned for sharing uh, their religious beliefs. Uh, there is an entire volume on the, uh, on the Irish uh, that um, I can send to Geneva and she can, uh, the Irish Quakers, I can send that to Geneva and it's, a, it's out of public uh, copyright so you can download the book, but it literally details a lot of the individuals who were being persecuted and why they may have come. Um, a few others uh, have asked about kind of, it's kind of an identity question. Um, so these settlers who are coming from um, Northern Ireland, coming into uh, what was then, you know, the American colonies, would they identify themselves as Scottish, Irish, Scots-Irish? So, what would they I call mean, themselves? It, it, yes and no. Uh, it, so in large part, what you see, of course, are a lot of the Presbyterians, especially um, as a result of like the 1798 re rebellion um, that are coming over. And the at that time, remember that Presbyterianism was largely Scottish. Uh, that was their official church. So they may identify themselves as Scots-Irish, but they may identify themselves as Scottish. Um, we have taken the terms of Ulster Scot, Scotch-Irish, et cetera, because of the amalgamation of the two uh, ethnicities, for lack of a better term, uh, within Ulster for such a long time that has kind of made its own like group. So they coming over, he may not get off the, the boat and say, yes, I'm Scots-Irish. Uh, he may say I'm Scottish and he goes to, you know, a Presbyterian church or whatever. Uh, but your subsequent research of understanding where they're settling um, and will oftentimes clue you into the fact that, yes, indeed, they are what we would term Scots-Irish. Um, a few other listeners have also asked about how do you get information about the Orange Lodges? <laughs> Yes. So um, like most fraternal organizations, keep in mind that the, uh, you know, they're a private entity, especially uh, there are some orange lodges that in Canada. Um, and uh, but they are basically you see them more in uh, the UK uh, and, you know, and especially in Ireland, uh, especially in July when the marching season begins in uh, certain areas of Ireland, uh, they will be in full regalia marching around. Um, there are some records that Crony has of some of the orange orders. And there are a number of books that have been published on the orangemen of Ireland, as well as you know, in Canada and stuff that may lead you to who as, you know, like most fraternal groups, you're gonna start by identifying your local lodge and reach out to them first. And like most fraternal groups, the information that they're going to have is not necessarily gonna be uh, like genealogical, you know, generation after generation, it's going to be about the member. Obviously the higher he is in the fraternal group, the more information there may be written about him. 
All right. Well, thank you again, Rhonda, for your fantastic presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. I know we did go over. Um, we aren't able to answer everyone's question uh, live during the session, but um, you can always contact us at education at nehgs.org if you have a question. You can also chat with our genealogists for free um, online, uh, 9 to 5 Eastern time. Um, you just go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. And also, if you have specific questions about your family history and you'd like guidance from a professional genealogist, including Rhonda, um, consider booking a one-on-one -on -one consultation with our experts. From DNA to family mysteries to uncovering immigrant origins to getting organized, we can help. So just visit our website or scan the QR code on your screen to schedule your appointment today. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more. And if you'd like to access other how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.